Awesome. Um, well, welcome everybody to the second session of the day. Um, I'm really excited. I know we're going to have four terrific presentations. And without further ado, we're going to start in the order of the program. So we're going to start with Liz Anker of Cornell, who is going to talk to us about the architecture of critique, some reflections on method in law, literature, and post-colonial theory. And I'm going to attempt to show PowerPoint. So I'm going to see if I can get that working before. Um, uh oh. Can people see? I, I'm unable to see people, but can you all see me nonetheless? Okay. Let me try that again. Um, so um, I'm going to apologize on that what I'm doing today is really pretty gestural. Um, like most of you, I'm guessing my brain has not worked since about March. And when it does vaguely work, um, um, I'm unable to think about much of anything other than the book I'm trying to finish. Um, that book actually has very little to do with literature or post-colonial theory. But what I'm going to do today is to um, try to bring some of its arguments to bear on this disciplinary juncture in a hopefully, hopefully polemical fashion. Um, as a field, post-colonial theory has experienced rather unusual fortunes of late, much like LGBTQ or queer theory. It came of age during theory's heyday in the Anglo-American Academy. And in many ways, few fields of at least literary study have more fully internalized theory's edicts or met with the vogue that post-colonial studies once possessed. But in the intervening years, that body of thought has remained unusually beholden to the configuration of theory that prevailed, say, when I finished graduate school. Fields like queer theory and work on race under the purview of American studies have lately been alive and abuzz with often exhilarating disputes over method, whether to spur theory in pioneering directions or to interrogate its foundational assumptions. Um, I'm thinking of something like affect studies or the special, special issue of differences on um, beyond anti-normativity in queer theory. Um, indeed, by many accounts, it is queer theorists like Eve Sedgwick, Sharon Marcus, and Heather Love who claim greatest credit for instigating the profound methodological rethinking that remains underway. This raises the twin questions, first, of why theorists of the global South can seem coolly indifferent to this larger climate of reevaluation, and second, of why post-colonial theory can seem, well, almost dead in the water. Put differently, where is post-colonial theories, Eve Sedgwick or Stephen Best or Fred Moten? A quick answer to these questions might caution that these method wars have often been conducted under the banner of critique and its limits, um, per Rita Felsky, because what would post-colonial studies be without the critique in particular of empire? Since its inception, has post-colonial studies been fully propelled by the critical mandate? When investigating law in the post-colony, it has therefore been a default premise that law will be shown a tool of imperialism, just as historically the rule of law has repeatedly been outed as a predicate and instrument to the civilizing mission. So law and literature in the global south would arguably lose its most basic mission without critique and everything it authorizes. However, if we take the focus off, off critique per se and shift to its dominant architecture, things get a lot more interesting because more than fidelity to critique alone has steeled post-colonial studies with a resistance to rethinking. Rather, more complicated answers to that resistance lie with what has been the prevailing methodology of critique really across the humanities and social sciences. And I'll wager that this architecture of critique, rather than critique per se, is what should trouble us. And precisely at the same time, because post-colonial studies allegiance to that stock method has, that, has been so unflagging, is that field something of a privileged forum for demonstrating multiple blind spots and even liabilities of the central tools through which critique has been conducted. So 
first, what is this architecture of critique? What constructs and tools have been the backbone of critique, not only within studies of literature or law or the global South, but really across theory as an intellectual formation? To keep law in focus, I'll simply offer one quotation, um, again, of countless examples I could bring up um, that you'll have to believe me is highly representative. We could find a similar quote regarding pretty much any legal construct out there, whether rights, contract, constitutionalism, what have you. Um, and this quote is also representative because it lends priority to contradiction in its critique of law and also offers us something of a model for thinking about contradiction as what places law and literature into dialogue that yokes them together. Um, you know, there are historians here, you'll have to trust me that a near parallel play, method plays out in much revisionist historiography. Um, and one other quote that is overtly about literature versus just culture that also locates ambiguity, complexity, paradox, contradiction at the heart of that um, nexus. So we could pause to ask, where does this come from? Is this Foucault or should we blame Lacan and Derrida? Is this the hermeneutics of suspicion? Some people are thinking, well, surely Marxist critique would never do this, but I'll simply give you a quote from Fred Jameson. Um, but moving on beyond this evidence, so to speak, designed to suggest that a particular architecture and also style of critique has unified the theory canon across fault lines and schools. Why should this worry us? Why might this architecture of critique prove, prove problematic? especially if it probably feels to so many of us like second nature. Um, and with that in mind, I'm gonna put forward three, again, very gestural concerns about this style of critique, although certainly countless we could assemble. Um, to begin, I'd like to suggest that such thinking reproduces a civilizational logic or a stagist conception of history of which post-colonial studies should be particularly wary. While such styles of reasoning descend from many complex intellectual roots, one clear derivation lies with discourses of modernization and modernity. Here today, I'm guessing we were all born and raised as academics on a distinct and recurring tale of the modern, and that tale is one of mounting paradox and contradiction. In such a narrative, Qualities like ambivalence and contradiction have both named modernization's negative bequests and its prolific bounty, as well as its ensuing fracture and dissolution. Um, but the point is that this plotting of modernity as a process of epistemic unmooring and fragmentation shows up all over the place and gets echoed again and again across the annals of theory. And I'm simply offering here my favorite statement of it, which is also telling because Brent um, Berman's title is, of course, taken from Engels and Marx. But while predictable, this story is further interesting to us because it has required for its backdrop the foil and specter of the ancient. In other words, a set of assumptions about pre-modern, pre-critical cultures. To stay focused on literary studies, some of our most seminal accounts of the politics of genre and form are erected on exactly such a polarization. For instance, here we can look very quickly to Bakhtin and Lukash, both of whom explain the novel's modern emergence by way of such a plotting, necessitating this myth of the pre-modern or Greek or ancient. Um, I won't pause to spell out the circuits that um, through which a thinker like Bakhtin has left an imprint on post-colonial studies. We could hardly talk about someone like Homi Baba's of, or even Salman Rushdie without evoking a grammar of hybridity, polyglossia, double voicedness. Because what simultaneously happens is that all sorts of other phenomena are commonly indicted like the totalizing Greek world as comparatively closed, unitary, harmonious, centralized, integrated, whole, absolutist, static, normative, homogenizing, and so on. Along with the pre-modern, those qualities have consistently been projected onto power, dominant histories, essentialist identities, liberalism, nationalism, and of course, law. But as we should know, this thinking is also the age-old anatomy of the colonial stereotype, Colonialist discourse has long relegated the global South 
to an effective condition of pre-modernity and therefore to a dearth or failure of critique. Of course, within the academy, there have been important calls for self-recrimination, dredging machines showing how entire fields have unwittingly permitted such stigmatizing binaries. Um, someone like Talal Asad's work has been so important on this front. Um, here he shows how even the idea of the local can carry such assumptions. Um, I can see you guys again now that I'm not sharing my screen. Um, but I'd like to take things even further than Talal Asad and ask, what if such a logic is hardwired into our methodology? What if a denigration of the local, the unitary, the non-paradoxical is the very DNA of critique? Or if we don't know how to be political without pathologizing critique's alleged deficit? Of course, this is one of the problems plaguing the progressive left right now. Um, um, many, including Foucault, have long observed that critique of the sort with practiced within theory cut its teeth on the problem of modernity. Critique and modernity were forged in a shared cauldron. But by extension, what if critique's very architecture is thus erected on a constructed set of assumptions about the lapse of the pre-modern and everything that category has telegraphed, whether totalitarianism for Bakhtin or neoliberalism today? What if critique is fatally parasitic on projected fears and fantasies regarding its antitheses? So my first concern is that even post-colonial theory can seem to marshal an epistemology that is strikingly colonialist in its fiber and that we might have expected the field to have better repudiated. You might still be saying, so what? Um, in the process, this epistemology of critique has installed criticism with certain at times glaring conceptual impediments. Indeed, it's not accidental that debates about secularism have long been a thorn in the side of post-colonial theory, given how few prospects other than perhaps post-critique are prone to inspire greater ire than talk of the post-secular. Accounts of modernity and secularization, of course, go hand in hand insofar as the secular life is conceived of one, I'm gonna quote Webb Keen, as quote, disembedded from various unities and abstracted from material and social entanglements. So perhaps the challenge is less to ask whether critique is secular than once again, to question whether secularism's architecture similarly betrays a not so subtle hostility to worldviews wrongly desirous of harmony, cohesiveness, self and communal integration and unitary belonging. Perhaps the conceit that sophisticated thought begins with ambiguity, complexity, and ambivalence has present, prevented a theorization of what Sabah Mahmood would call cultures oriented toward cohabitation, attachment, intimate proximity, and assimilation. To conclude, I'd like to suggest that this architecture of theory of critique can similarly distort our ideas about the law and literature nexus. As Bernie from our earlier panel and I have um, argued elsewhere, law and literature can seem prone to scapegoat law while allowing literature to play savior. This syndrome can also be attributed to the Manichaeanism I've been contemplating, wherein critique is imagined to unearth ambivalence, contradiction, and paradox, and structures of power like law instead to abhor those qualities. Too frequently, our interdiscipline rationalizes its very existence by casting law as a mechanism for repressing ambivalence, for silencing difference, for imposing false closure and coherence on indeterminacy. That law, that picture of law, I've argued, um, is a legacy of an enduring framework for reckoning with modernity and its instrumentalizations. But when all is said and done, it can also seem a foregone conclusion that law will be revealed fundamentally hostile to critique and its architecture. However, last point to conclude, are things so easy? Is law so poor and are the virtues of so critique so clearly safeguarded by ambiguity and contradiction? If anything has emerged over the last few years, it is first that we need to view the rule of law in less monochromatic, less monolithic ways. And second, it is that rather than critique per se, insistence on incurable, overwhelming, indeterminacy, ambiguity, and contradiction that is likely 
to backfire, to hijack public reason and to pose an existential threat to democracy. Thank you, Liz. Um, we're now going to turn to Palomi Saha of UC Berkeley, who will talk to us about what she calls spiritual tax haven. Thanks so much, Lottie. I'm so happy to be here. Um, this is kind of early work in um, my new book project called Fascination, which is on American Hindu cults. And um, this talk is a little more narrative than I normally would, but I think I'm talking through a story that uh, hopefully will usefully, if not illuminate something about law and literature, um, at least maybe get us to some questions I've been trying to ask. Um, okay. So in 1981, the year that Ronald Reagan was sworn in as president of the United States, promising to usher in a time of increased individual liberty, defatted federal government, and unfettered freedom of the market, the Bhagavan Sri Rajneesh invited his followers to join him in Oregon on much the same promise. A self-declared material spiritualist and rich man's guru, Rajneesh fled in India that had returned Indira Gandhi to power and redoubled its commitment to a socialist economic and law and order political status quo. He also fled a $5 million tax bill issued by the Indian government when it denominated the Pune ashrams tax exempt charitable status. Establishing the Rajneesh International Corporation, legally unrelated to his tax liability, Rajneesh fashioned a classic American tale fleeing religious persecution, seeking the land of liberty and freedom, excuse me, washing up on the shores of a land accustomed to welcoming refugees. But the cargo planes that carried the first of Rajneesh's Rolls Royces right over Ellis Island actually landed in Montclair, New Jersey, his first port of entry, and are waiting plan to relocate to the wide expanse of the frontier in the West. Though the 2018 Netflix docu-series Wild Wild Country chronicles the fall of that planned utopia in Oregon, Rajneesh's vision was in many ways startlingly congruent to the vision of America on which Reagan swept to victory. He was an Indian guru uniquely suited to this American moment, promising a spiritualism that cohered the nostalgic of free love and the aspirational pull of the free market. He attracted American followers who were largely well-educated and affluent, offering a form of spiritual life that did not require asceticism, but rather reveled in opulence. To become a sannyasi, which is the term for the disciples of Rajneesh, from the Sanskrit sannyasa, a stage of spiritual development marked by renunciation, meant in this case taking on a new name. Men were given the Indian names that began with the honorific Swami, and women Ma for the affixation of both mother and goddess, but it did not mean relinquishing one's bank account or parting with one's consumer habits. While Rajneesh employed Hindu Sanskrit, Sanskrit nomenclature for the Sassi, he militated against its normal deployment, going so far as to call them neo sannyasi where the traditional sannyasi gave up all material trappings of their previous life. His sannyasi were asked to own a particular form of materialism, a capitalist ethos. Capitalism, Rajneesh writes, quote, is a humanistic system which gives full freedom to all kinds of people in all directions of life to grow and to be themselves, end quote. It is the freedom of the market that conditions the freedom of the self, spirituality as a commodity form. If, as Marx tells us, commodity fetishism is the phantasmatic force comparable only to religion that transforms the care of an object, commodity spiritualism is the reverse, the transformation of the spirit, that is, immaterial body, into an apprehendable and indeed exchangeable one. The practice of ritual life for the Rajneeshis was in this way intimately tied up with purchasing power. Rajneesh writes of the original ashram in Pune, a sentiment that would be magnified exponentially in Oregon, quote, this place is a marketplace. Can you find another place like that is more like a market? That's why Indians are very annoyed. They can't understand. They've known ashrams for centuries, but this ashram is beyond their comprehension. They cannot think that you have to pay to listen to a religious discourse. They always listen free of charge. Here, you always, always have to pay, end quote. And pay they did. For courses and other trainings through the Rajneesh International University, 
for crimson hue clothes in every style, for every activity, from aerobics to late night dancing, at on-site boutiques that marked their affiliation, for jot malas, prayer beads with Rajneesh's face in a locket, uh, for their daily meditations, the Rajneeshis were also encouraged as the structures of capitalism and discipleship demanded to make money for the guru, investing in a range of commercial and entrepreneurial ventures that would bear his stamp, if not his name. An international network that was rhizomatic in its expanse, Rajneeshi enterprises balanced a range of profit-making endeavors while maintaining the legal and social ethos of a charitable organization for the ashram in Oregon, a spiritual tax haven. I'll here spoil for you those who haven't seen uh, Wild Wild Country or don't remember the trials of Rajneesh Bur Rajneesh and his former secretary who becomes kind of the star of Wild Wild Country, Sheila, uh, and a dozen other followers were actually tried and convicted in 1986 for a range of crimes from immigration fraud, wiretapping, wire arson, and attempted murder. Uh, Sheila serves years in prison for attempted murder and arson, and the Bhagwan entered an Alfred plea on counts of immigration fraud for both having overstayed his visa and for conducting sham marriages, and he agrees to leave the United States. Today, though, our brief was to talk about law and literature. I'm actually not going to talk about these legal machinations at all um, or the decline of the Oregon commune. Rather, I'm interested in how a particularly financialized ritual structure of the right species comes to pose a legal and social problem in the first place. Ultimately, the Rajneeshis follow the edict of their guru to be material spiritualists. Materiality manifests most vividly, and here I'm going to try and show an image. Uh, let's see. My technology capacity will fail me, I'm sure. Yes. Uh, so um, the, this materiality poses, manifests most vividly in the body of Rajneesh himself, his bespoke metallic space suits with Grace Jones shoulder pads, his vaunted collection of Rolex watches, and the oft-mentioned parade of Rolls Royces. But in order to maintain the profit of the Rajneesh endeavor, it was crucial that the ashram eligible for tax exempt status under section 501c3 of the IRS, uh, of the Internal Revenue Code. This is a hallowed element of the tax code because it appears as an annotation for the reason that the Rajneeshis come to America in the first place. That is the First Amendment. Not only does the statute protect religious organizations from taxation, it protects them from undue audit by the IRS, that is potential harassment by the government. Thus, the distance between the corporate elements of the Rajneeshi movement and the spiritual ones were to be carefully monitored by the federal government, who were keen to locate the overlap between the two that might prove financial wrongdoing. This would go on to drive part of the INS's efforts in 1982 and 1983 to deny Rajneesh's visa renewal as a religious leader. These joint governmental threats to the Rajneesh project in America led the organization to codify itself, its practices and beliefs in this moment, to prove in an idiom familiar to the American government that it had indeed a truly spiritual life. The Rajneeshis faced a challenge here common to the world of, quote, new religious movements to make themselves legible before both law and society as on the path to the temporarily unmodified religion and not, as claims would dog them, a cult. Because accusations of cultishness insistently turn to the law, not as a diagnostic of authentic spiritual affect, but as an arbiter of accept acceptable ritual action, where the true spirit of a cult cannot be controlled, freedom of religion, its materiality can and is regulated, in particular through taxation and financial oversight. This for the Rajneeshis and their openly and indeed ecstatically financialized rituals posed a particular problem for their vision of a shining city upon a hill out in Western Oregon. In some ways, Rajneesh's economic philosophy was intimately tied with his spiritual outlook. 
He attacks asceticism, simplicity, provincialism, but he's also embodying a kind of embo uh, sensuous spirituality that was all about modern technology and Western capitalism. Come for the spiritual awakening, stay for the other pleasures of the flesh. Fleshliness and its various consumption were central to the rituals of the Rajneeshis and to the suspicion they faced from the antelope neighbors and government officials alike. While the country spares very little time to the aspects of the Rajneeshis that drew the most social opprobrium in this moment, the claims of sexual orgies, of meditation that was a guise for naked violent writhing, but in the sense that it was less a religious organization and more a sex cult, the Rajneesh movement was uncomfortably returning the family values orientation of 1980s America to this prior moment of free love, now hewed with a kind of idic quality. It made it a kind of a particularly ominous threat. But the nature of that threat actually reveals much more about conceptions of Americanness in this moment than about Rajneesh theology as in particular in the Wild Wild Country documentary, we see the Rajneeshis drawn as sharp contrast to the residents of Antelope, playing out a historically um, resolute uh, encounter between the American frontier, which is endlessly private and lucrative. This is a settler colonial vision that is consistently alluring. And indeed, I'm going to say here, it is another story of cowboys and Indians. Coding the Rajneeshis as an Indian cult in the 1980s does necessary narrative work for the inhabitants of Antelope and the Dales in Oregon uh, in their repudiation of and their campaign against the movement. But the demographics of the commune defy this characterization. Rather, what makes it clear is that the symbolic and material sway of the two most visible Indians in the commune make for its name. So Rajneesh and his secretary, Ma Anand Sheila. Rajneesh as leader and icon is spectacular in his public performance of celebrity. I'm just going to show you once again this remarkable image in um, a relatively poor rural part of Western Oregon. Um, but he, in these years, in, trapped in the documentary, actually does not speak. He takes a vow of silence from the year 1981 to the year 1985. Um, and so he is silent and yet incredibly visible. And Sheila, the purported deputy, is in turn most striking in her speech, in its publicness, its directness, its quotability. You've perhaps seen uh, the clips of her saying tough titties um, and telling uh, uh, you know, police to go fuck themselves. This is a kind of uh, viral image of Sheila that's been circulating especially recently. Um, these are the Indians that the cowboys set out to vanquish. Indeed, John Bowerman, who appears in the docuseries as the voice of the resistant ranchers and locals, um, is actually most famous not by his own virtue, by virtue of his father, who you may know um, is in fact the beloved uh, track coach of the University of Oregon um, and several Olympic teams and the founder of the Nike Shoe Company. So Bowerman, who John Bowerman, who styles himself a rugged, self-made individualist, actually inherits a massive fortune from his father uh, and the Nike Shoe Company. So what we see here sorry, I've lost. Oh goodness. Sorry, things have gone terribly awry. Um, what we see here in this game of cowboys and Indians is not actually the ways in which Hollywood might uh, play this trope of the rugged individualist and the silent naturalist. Though uh, the ranch on which our Jewish firm is built is actually first made famous in Hollywood as uh, the set of the Rooster Coborn movies. So we have the kind of haunting of this vision of cowboys and Indians. Um, but in this case, uh, what is actually at stake are two deeply divergent corporate and consumptive visions, one of an intentional community, the other of a settler colonial manifest destiny. 
of the range of development products that have uh, of, of projects on the Big Muddy Ranch, which is Rajneeshpuram. There are um, there's a 3,000 acre agricultural enterprise. There is um, a food project, and first and foremost, they build a mall. They build first for this community a financial neurosystem, because being able to buy symbols of belonging to where was essential to the ritual practice of the Rajneeshis. It's no coincidence then that the hordes of Rajneeshis walking through the streets of Antelope dressed all in red um, in various hues was deeply troubling to these people. Because in Antelope, where in, 1980s, in the 1980s, the average income was under $20,000, you see a vast discrepancy between the purchasing power being hallowed and indeed fetishized in Rajneesh Forum and the capacity of the so-called authentic inhabitants of Antelope to purchase anything at all. So in some ways, the battle between the Rajneeshis and the locals is in part about where the proceeds of corporate money go. Do they go back into this vision of the commune in which you continue to purchase the artifacts of your own spiritual practice? Or do they go towards this vision of maintaining a site untainted by all aspects of foreignness and indeed um, excessive consumption impossible to the inhabitants? While the Bowerman fortune owes itself to the popularity of Nike, the boutique that was set up in the Rajneesh Forum Ranch had these varied hues of clothing that went from red to purple, and indeed also engaged into a broader corporate infrastructure when they entered in 1983 into an exclusive contract with the Levi Strauss Company to produce a proprietary colored denim available in several cuts in several hues only for sale in Rajneesh Forum. Denim, perhaps more than any other fabric, is symbolic of America, of the wild, wild west. And Levi's surely clothe not just the Rajneeshis in their sunset hued jeans, but their wary neighbors too. Despite openly capitalist projects of the Rajneeshis, the Antelopians, you can say, saw red, both rage and a kind of threat, both. Um, not even their dungarees in this moment seemed safe from the taint and tint of the red people. Wild Wild Country and the news coverage of the Rajneeshis makes much of Rajneesh's body himself, his extravagance, the sheer opulence of his bespoke wardrobe. For federal authorities, these are indications of financial impropriety for residents of Antelope which continues to be a, a remarkably poor rural town, Rajneesh's ostentation was a transitive condition magnified across the population of the commune. For this um, is the distributive power of communal life, where the Rajneeshis announce themselves to each other and their neighbors uh, at, uh, in the collective hue of their famous robes, made themselves an extension of Rajneesh himself and his eponymous project. It is the, in this way that they build a spiritual marketplace that, in which communi communality financializes ecstasy. Com com commodity capitalism here doesn't replace a prior form of religious feeling. It in fact profits from it. Thank you so much, Pumami. That's so fascinating. Um, our third presenter is Jean Marie Jackson of Johns Hopkins and Jean Marie will be presenting Bringers of Faith and sorry, bringers of fact and faith, legal uh, messianism in the Gold Coast intelligentsia. Okay, so I, I seem to have unmuted at the right time, so off to a good start. Um, thank you, Brian, um, for inviting me and for all the participants. This has been a great way to spend a Friday. <clears throat> My dear Mr. Aminsang, the Gold Coast lawyer and statesman, John Mensah Sarba begins his major work from 1904. Pardon the liberty I take in sending you this open letter with this my first attempt in the thorny paths of literature. The work here referred to is called Fanti Customary Laws, 
a foundational effort, as Mensa Sarba puts it, at grouping and classifying key decisions from the Supreme Court of the Gold Coast in order to offer a systematic account of indigenous Akan social and institutional practices. And so I don't know what people have in their own um, research background. So Akan is the largest ethnicity in what is today Ghana. Um, and then Fantis and more famously Ashantis are two of the three biggest sort of sub ethnicities of that major population. At first glance, Mentasarba's compendium of legal cases covering points from property to marriage to clan succession is anything but literary. What I want to argue today is that the thorny paths of literature in which Mensa Sarba implicates his legal treatise is in fact shorthand for a grand project of civilizational advancement by self-systematization. Not just cultural invention, as might be more obviously befitting of an effort to document and thereby in some sense make real customary alongside common law in a British colony. While Fanti customary laws does in fact serve an ethnographic purpose, surfacing, collating, and explaining local knowledge that had been overlooked in colonial courtrooms, it's part of an intellectual moment that sets its aims much higher than that. Contextualized within an early 20th century Fanti coastal intelligentsia, including figures like J.E. Casely Hayford and J.W. de Graft Johnson, Mensasarba's work is key to a broader vision of customary law and autoethnography as forces for Fonti's self-professed and God-ordained imperial leadership. I've joked with a couple of colleagues who know this mulu well that I'm writing about Fonti's who think they're Jesus, and I have to admit that I'm not being altogether flippant. In fact, Fonti customary laws, along with other legal humanistic treatises from the period, most prominently Casely Hayford's Gold Coast Native Institutions, completed in the same year of 1903, aim to sacralize law as a crucial tool of their self-determination. So not only do these Gold Coast intellectuals see Fanti and to only some degree Akan institutions as equally and intrinsically authoritative to British ones and thus worthy of textual record and formal recognition, they also see their own capacity to create this record as part and parcel of a cultural messianic calling and indeed the British Empire's multivalent redemption. I'm proposing essentially that the Gold Coast at the turn of the 20th century quite neatly inverts the foundational narrative of law's centrality to state secularization and by extension demands an analytic approach that does something other than demystify. The most conceptually hard hitting work on Western law and religion from Schmidt's writing on Weber on up starts from the premise that Christianity is lurking beneath the surface of Western legality. Or as the editors of After Secular Law put it, that a rightly critical approach to the law aims at debunking religious neutrality to reveal Christian residue repressed at the foundations of the modern state often likened to the French philosophes and their weaving together of aesthetics, philosophy, law, and politics. And I'll note, although it's not in this paper, more interestingly, uh, language systematization. The Gold Coast intelligentsia take their interests in the opposite direction. Rather than secularize theological concepts, and namely the biggest one, ultimate authority, or as the legal theorist Canal Parker puts it, where the buck stops, they construct a theological rationale for their cultural pluralization of secular and colonial legality. Now, the Christian bottom line of Fonti's self-rule here is quite transparent. Casely Hayford's 1911 novel called Ethiopia Unbound, for example, culminates in a chapter called And a Little Child Shall Lead Them, clearly an analogy for the Fonti's rise from imperial underdog to civilizational beacon. In Gold Coast Native Institutions, his legal humanistic treatise, the future of the human race is explicitly linked to Fonti's unique qualifications to restore the British Empire to its bygone moral promise. If you believe me that the Gold Coast and Ashanti will lead the way in what will prove the grandest conception of the 20th century, Casely Hayford writes, grandest because Ethiopia will have at length raised up her hand until God allow me to indicate what sort of an empire this shall be and on what lines it shall work. 
In Mensa Sarba's other major work, the Fonti National Constitution from 1906, he too relies on an analogy between Fonti lawyers' rather prosaic mission of legal standardization and the erection of a Christian infrastructure in Nazareth. I could go on. The point here is that the form of the legal humanistic treatise at this point offers a space for customary standardization, cultural explication, and also theological motivation. That motivation in turn requires not only a national but an imperial framework in the broadest sense to really be intelligible since what we might call the ultimate or totalizing stakes of imperial ambition, the thing against which they're erecting their state, is something these figures want to retain as a mandate for national consolidation. To understand their work as it usually is, as a quick note uh, in passing about anti-colonial nationalism then, is certainly not wrong, but it is quite meaningfully incomplete. Self-determination for Mensa Sarba, Casely Hayford, and their ilk is not simply a matter of projecting a nation outward in opposition to power, but of shaping their new sense of Fonti civilization to fit within the pre-existing constraint of a God-given totality for which imperial power at least nominally strives. And Parker also writes, I think really interestingly um, in the consolidation of American common law in the 19th century, of the 19th century um, as a project of grand constraint. Um, it's a really provocative argument, I think. Now, all of this has an obvious historical explanation, which is that Protestant missionary activity heats up on the Gold Coast concomitant with the consolidation of British power there, beginning in earnest in the mid 19th century. I hasten to note that this is not a straightforward timeline. Um, West Africa is not Southern Africa, is not East Africa. Um, and there's actually an independent state for six years called the Fonti Confederation, 1868 to 1874, that has a judiciary and an army um, and taxation powers that the British recognize and that see themselves as hosts effectively to uh, colonial uh, helpers in their mind. The non-denominational Basel mission begins operating on the Gold Coast in 1828, from which emerges in 1895 the region's foundational historical text, the history of the Gold Coast in Ashanti by the Ga speaking scholar, physician, and pastor, Carl Christian Reindorf. J. E. Casely Hayford's father, Joseph de Graff Hayford, more or less wiped from the history books after the erection of the official Ghanaian state, Ghana Ghanaian state in 57, was himself an influential Methodist minister. The intermingling of so-called native sensibilities and Christian missionary zeal is a truism of African studies, as is Christianity's later rejection in favor of a recovered indigeneity. But I'm not an historian or an anthropologist, as my colleagues would be quick to remind me. And the fact of cultural intermingling or its refutation is really not what interests me about this group of Gold Coast texts and figures. What I'm drawn to here is the route they offer to conceptualizing the origins of modern African self-determination the Fonti Confederation, um, although not very well known, is really the first uh, African, modern African state, as intrinsically literary in nature, riffing on Mensa Sarba's surprising description of his legal undertaking as a thorny literary path. So what if, instead of seeing law and Christianity as forces thrown together by the course of colonial history, we take their interplay in this formative political moment as a blueprint for the conceptual tectonics of self-determination as such. Rather than overwrite secular authority onto a theological source text, these Gold Coast legal humanistic endeavors seek openly to reconcile multiple and often quite contradictory forms of ultimate authority with one another and as themselves. They are the particular kind of character type. I have an essay coming out soon on the characterology of this period um, that is uniquely able to do this in world history. Their authors are subject and scribe, godly servant and civic leader. Self-determination in the Fonti case is the lost historical starting point of this Fonti confederation past, the state I mentioned, and the predestined finish line toward which its successors strive. And so the tenor of these texts is unsurprisingly a collision of extremes, 
with bureaucratic minutia licensing grand messianic projection and vice versa. On one page of Fonti customary laws, Mensa Sarba primes readers for the case descriptions to come by explaining the clan structure of Fonti life. So there are 12 of these big clans. Um, they still exist, they're less powerful now. And they're passed patrilineally uh, and whose rules at that point in the 19th century and going into the 20th obviously had huge bearing on what would become customary law. In the following paragraph, he suddenly soars to a hope that clan feeling one day as great in the qualities which have ever graced manhood in all ages and under all climes, this tiny population, um, not even 2 million people, I believe at that point, will drive imperial ascendance. In closing, there are a few things we can take from all this that I hope among other things can help build some much needed bridges between African intellectual histories that I've occasionally been advised are obscure and fundamental questions about textuality in our profession. First, a comprehensive history of legal cultures in the British empire must include a reckoning with law's active enchantment not simply its Weberian inverse, that then leads itself to equally, I think, kind of easy undoing. This cannot be a simple matter of injecting peripheral perspectives into metropolitan narratives. In fact, the Gold Coast intellectuals I foregrounded here were fully attuned to the norms of both and subscribed to as much of the imperial mission as they rejected. Second, an expanded view of African literature one that does not start from decolonization in the middle of the 20th century, needs to account for the interpenetration of fields and disciplines that only later become discrete, law, anthropology, history, theology, and moral thought. Literature as such is obviously left out here, weird since I'm a comparative literature scholar. So let me finally venture a reading that I'm only just beginning to work out and I'm not quite sure I'd yet put in print. In the key texts of Fonti's self-inscription and civilizational ambition, we can theorize the literary as the conjunction of multiple sources of ultimate authority without undermining any one. God, man, nation, empire, the fine print of African custom, and the sublime universalizing possibility of Christian faith. Literature, not as fiction, but as force. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, absolutely fascinating. So I don't want to take too long because we have less than half an hour for discussion. And if the last session was any indication, the audience questions were phenomenally rich um, and not all of them were answered. So I'll just say a few things. Um, one of them is that Liz started, up, started us off um, by making us think about contradiction, right? So she's suggesting that the idea of contradiction or paradox has become this kind of epistemology of critical theory. And if we focus on contradiction, what is then left out? And I had to notice then in everybody's titles, contradiction or paradox actually appeared. So we have material and spiritual, fact and faith, and order and disorder, right? So um, one thing that we might um, uh, question or contemplate are in what ways do presumed contradictions between these concepts structure our ways of thinking? And when we do this, what then ends up getting left out of the discussion? So in Liz's paper, she at the end was talking about ways in which um, there's this broad assumption that uh, law is revealed as hostile to critique. Um, and she says, are things so easy? Is law so poor? If anything has, has emerged, it reveals uh, that the rule of law should be seen in less monochromatic ways. And so one thing I might ask Liz is, is it law or is it the rule of law? Like those two things aren't necessarily the same thing. Um, and ways in which the presumption in law and literature has often been that literature is somehow the savior to law. Can we think about law as the savior to literature in ways beyond the like disciplinary financial like literary departments <laughs> looking to law as a way, just as like the rise of the digital humanities or, or at UC Berkeley, like you can, I think in, in English, isn't there like a data science track that people can link to, All right? So, so 
does law function in, in other ways as the savior to, to, to literature beyond that? Um, uh, Palomi, such a fascinating story. Um, I, was, I was hoping you would say something about ways in which the attempted murder charge had to do with uh, deliberately infecting people with salmonella as a way of interfering with elections as um, something speaking precisely to uh, the moment that we're existing in right now. Um, but I'm so struck with the ways that both your paper or talk and Jean Marie's are about foundings. And so if we could link what Bernie Myler was saying about foundings uh, to the moments that you were talking about, um, and with Pulumi, the this incredible um, layering of uh, the founding of a cult, right? Is that the founding of the sort of, you said the city of a hill in Western, uh, city upon a hill in Western Oregon. So the founding of this new social order, but layered in this settler colonial context where from um, what I understood you to be saying is that the people already living in Oregon before the, uh, followers of Sri Bhagwan Rajneesh came, saw themselves as cowboys, right? Who are trying to evict the Indians, right? Who are Sri Rajneesh and his followers, if, if that's um, correct. So, so just thinking about um, this very interesting uh, layering of um, settler colonialism with this founding of this cult, which is not attempting to actually uh, direct governance for that entire community, but is nonetheless seen as somehow taking over. Um, uh, and then for Jean Marie, um, so interesting um, thinking about what you said about laws enchantment, um, the, the, the way in which um, you have this, uh, pro as you said in Kunal Parker, this project of grand constraint creating the, the American common law and how is this like or unlike that situation? And, you mentioned um, that this founding was literary in nature, and I was hoping you could say a little bit more about that. Is that in, I, I know that one of the people involved in this moment um, wrote literary works, but how else is this founding literary? Um, and then for Mona, um, so fascinating. Um, I would love to hear more about the concepts and their attendant figures. How did you pick these figures? Were there other figures that were possibly the figures that were um, associated? And they don't, they don't all seem similar, right? In terms of some seem perhaps intuitive attendant figures that go with these concepts and others do not. Um, so for example, cast on the convert, um, uh, war and the terrorist. Um, uh, and I'm also interested to think about ways in which sometimes those figures appear because they are structured by legal requirements for redress or recognition, right? So you've got the figure of war and the refugee, um, but not always. Um, and you also said something about these attendant figures um, and the idea of character. And so I'm interested to think about by character, do you mean literary character? And how do we think about um, the relationship between legal figures and literary characters, like what's the correspondence between those two terms. Um, okay, so if anybody wants to respond, um, please do so. And then, and actually maybe each of you should respond. And then uh, Brian is gonna pop up again um, with some audience questions. Should we go in order or? Sure. So let's do. Sure. Yes. Um, no, I'm, I'm interested in um, um, arguing that humanist critics should be less hard on law, broadly speaking. Um, I think we gain a lot in our own self images um, by offsetting our conception of what we do by kind of a spectralized account of what the juridical or legalization are. Um, and that those terms can almost operate in a figural sense that um, serves to justify or redeem humanistic inquiry. So I'm interested in both um, kind of thinking about the work of self-justification that this sort of, you know, large looming threat of legalization plays and understanding what the humanities think they're doing, um, but also from a very practical sense that the rule of law is in crisis. And I fear that people who've devoted their careers to critique, which 
is an important and good thing. I don't mean to minimize that, but that we're ill-equipped to talk about what's valuable in a normative sense about systems of law and precise legal principles that we become very uncomfortable, if not squeamish, if we have to say why one should get behind the rule of law under certain circumstances. So I'm trying to think about how theory can um, grapple with and kind of willingly embrace those aspects of, you know, legality or the juridical under certain in certain cases. Um, thank you. That was, that was such good questions, Letty. Um, the question of founding is super interesting when it comes to the Rajneeshis because I've been thinking through the kind of counterfactual possibility. If the Rajneeshis had established themselves as a corporation in Oregon, would this have become a different story? Right? There's something about the story about the commune and this attempt to become a town that raises the hackles of the inhabitants of Antelope and it really does become anxieties about communism, about the sex cult, but somewhere if they had led with what is the true ethos of the organization, which is corporate, it may have looked really different. Um, and this actually leads to the, the, the issue of the salmonella. So this is the most salacious part of the Rajnishi story. Um, they're accused of actually like blending muskrats um, to, to extract salmonella and they poison the sizzler salad bar. And that's the part that I've been thinking for a lot because it seems to me the heart of the conflict. A sizzler in a town like Antelope is both um, a deep aspiration, but such it's such like the token image of 1980s Reagan America, right? It is an accessible luxury where you go for the 9.99 steak, but really you stay for the salad bar, right? It's the all you can eat salad bar, which is a site of kind of mass consumption, but it is also the accessible consumption. And attacking that salad bar, I think, especially given the kind of corporate purchasing power of the Rajneeshis, is about the economic force that they wanted to, to kind of establish themselves as. And I think that violence really speaks much more to the conflict than like ideological concerns about whether or not, you know, they're communists, because clearly they're not. So I think that somewhere it is, it's really the salad bar that's the, the key to thinking about what, um, what what's going on there and also again like you know it's hard not to be moved by the plight of the the antelopians in some ways right they this is a town that it's still the vast majority of its population is well under the poverty line so you know what it means to kind of have this massive influx of seemingly foreign money um, and then have this moment of violence at this site of like real americana um, is I think really telling. Um, thanks, Letty, for these really good questions. Um, I can kind of tackle the issue of founders, um, the issue of contradiction and paradox, and perhaps what I meant by a literary nature all in one by just saying a little bit more about this period that I've become really fascinated by. I have history, my, my whole career is a history of just obsessions that I just like go nuts with for five years and then you know, <laughs> move on. But um, this period in uh, Gold Coast history, which is hugely significant for the formation of later Pan-Africanisms, um, you know, there's no Nkrumah, Kwame Nkrumah, or the Big Six in Ghana without any of these figures who are much lesser known, um, et cetera, et cetera. These are people who are actually doing things, by which I mean that they are building um, Ghana's first secondary schools that are sort of hybrid mission, typically Methodist, um, although not always, and um, uh, local language curricula. Um, they are founding associations that are stricken by conflict within themselves. Um, things that to a quick reader now would seem like, oh, of course they're all on board with anti-colonialism. Just, it didn't divide that way. Um, so we have huge rifts between people who want a prominent role for chiefs um, and then people who don't, right? People who want a sort of some degree secularized, although as I've said, not really, um, Western educated elite to be in a leadership position. And then if you actually go back to the archive and you follow it, um, people's roles will totally flip, you know, within a five year span. So there's no way even of pinning them down. Um, and the reason for that is because they have to do stuff that is actually working. Um, they are building institutions in the most immediate 
sense. They are getting funding. Um, so, the, you know, there are a couple of prominent families on the Gold Coast at this point. Um, you can read their letters and talk about just keeping the coffers full um, to be able to, to fund this sort of proto state. Um, and so they have to find a way of reconciling the extremely practical dimension of state building um, and the visionary dimension of literature, which is why someone like J.E.K. Sully Hayford does write a novel. Um, it's actually the first novel ever to be published by an African writer in English, or at least lays, lays strong claim to that title. And there are a couple of plays and um, you know, religious treatises that I think would more readily fall into the literary domain. Um, but they are often described as radicals or proto-radicals or proto-nationalists. Proto um, I don't think those terms are actually very meaningful. I think like a lot of the contradictions and paradoxes, they're kind of um, saddled with them many, many decades later, um, because actually they're trying to figure out how to be very, very incremental working at the ground level of, as I said, secondary school building. Um, and then having a theorization of what they're doing that is grand enough um, to circulate around their community and then overseas, they have readers in England as well. Um, so, so that's my answer, I think, to all of those questions is that there is a very minute and fascinating trading off between um, the real and the ideal, um, you know, kind of self-conscious utopianism and nitty gritty incremental erection of new buildings and institutions. Thank you so much for uh, these questions. I'll, I think I've written them all down and hopefully I'll, I'll answer them in the order that you asked. Um, so the first question uh, was about um, how, in, about, um, so the, the, concepts, the concepts and attendant figures, some seem intuitive and others don't. Um, and uh, likewise, how some figures um, emerge uh, through law. So I think the initial, so the prior question was about where these, these concepts and attendant figures came from. And certainly they came out of a particular point in time in my career between a postdoc and the beginning of my, my professorship. And I was, uh, I was given almost free, free say or uh, um, freedom in designing the courses that I wanted to teach. Um, so, you know, my, my research area is particularly administrative law and religion. And I thought, well, I'm not sure undergraduate students would really be so interested in, in, in that kind of um, specificity. But how can I teach regulation in a way that is more interesting and more expansive um, and can more directly uh, engage uh, where engage um, engage students um, over a 13 week semester. Certainly, administrative law is uh, it, it gets it gets a bad name, uh, I think, in, in the legal academy, but it's it's the law that I find most fascinating precisely because it, affect, it affects the, the greatest number of people. But in any case, um, I came up with these um, with the, the framework for the course, which uh, eventually I adopted for the class, uh, adopted for the book in part because because I saw an opportunity to think more expansively about regulation, uh, both at the state level and so and um, and and, so, and social level. Um, so I hope that answers a bit um, bit of the question. Um, what about what about the figures that emerge through law? That's 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 a really important point. When I teach War on the Terrorist, for example, there I draw quite a bit on film. Um, to explain this process in particular. Actually, Letty, I, I signed your work and I know my students were sort of very excited to see that you were overseeing this panel. Uh, but there's quite a bit of this work that I do um, um, through film and film criticism. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how to do that um, in, um, in the book, primarily through literature. But for example, one way that I do it in the indigeneity and the native chapter is um, if we're using Erdrich's uh, The Roundhouse, one of the major concepts that um, animates that book is, um, is jurisdiction. Um, and without giving the book away or the plot, plot away too much, there's a question that the family affected by um, the violence perpetrated against the woman and the protagonist's family, the question of jurisdiction emerges uh, because where the crime was committed um, against the, 
the woman um, affects the laws that apply um, in that case. So students and uh, likewise readers of the of the book will um, um, uh, will see uh, will we'll see the, cat the 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 categorization or so the productivity of law in that in that sense too as creating categories that are then regulated by various administrative um, agencies. Thank you all so much. Um, we um, we can have some questions from the audience. The queue um, of questions is, is quite short right now. So if you'd like to um, if you'd like to ask a question, please um, feel free to to type it into the Q and A and not not the chat box. There's good discussion going on about the Sizzler salad bar and other things in the in the chat box. Um, if you would like um, for your question to be voiced, please type it in the Q and A. I'll actually ask something quickly um, before we go into the Q and A for um, for Professor Jackson. I'm so interested in this this Gold Coast case you're talking about. I'm very interested in its conceptual implications as well. You know, you you really I think spell out um, so powerfully why it it requires um, a kind of rethinking or a kind of um, abandonment of the commitment to a kind of narrative of secularization or of the laws disembedding from society or its autonomization. Um, also at the same time, you suggest you know it, it's I mean it's such an interesting case for thinking about legal pluralism. Actually, some of the categories that um, Professor Arabi was talking about in her talks, you know, it, it, interesting apply, I think, to this case. But, you know, usually we think about legal pluralism as involving these kinds of multiple normative orders that require some negotiation, you know, a kind of situation of multiplicity in some cases, maybe where one of the orders disempowers the others or even extinguishes them through a process of colonization. Obviously, what you're talking about here with this kind of self-conscious integration of, you know, multiple and even incommensurate normative orders, you know, in, in this process of founding is totally fascinating. Um, you also mentioned when you were talking about the, um, uh, the I think it was your essay about character, characterology, that, you know, this is almost a kind of unique situation or maybe a unique situation in world history. So my question is about, you know, the distinctiveness or even perhaps the singularity of this Gold Coast situation and you know what what that distinctiveness or singularity means for us as we try to kind of follow out the conceptual implications of this in, in, you know incredibly fascinating case. Yeah, thank you. Um, so they absolutely saw themselves as unique. Uh, the characterology piece is J. E. Casely Hayford, um, Mensa Sarba, the two kind of big leaders at this moment, um, but also de Graff Johnson, and then a little bit later, um, the Reverend Esrbi Atoahuma, who's also part of the uh, founding narrative of Ghana in the 50s. Um, the uniqueness falls out of it uh, over the course of the 20th century in their own description of it. And I have a number of theories about why that's the case. Um, a lot of it is a sort of practical uh, what Ghana's founders later on referred to as detribalization. Um, so, you know, if you are a Ghanaian student today at what was founded as a sort of Fanti school, which were extremely different as uh, Kwesi Kunedu has a fantastic book, um, different educational norms in the 19th century in uh, the Gold Coast and Ashanti, um, you don't really learn about subnational histories or sort of proto-national histories that are in conflict with what then becomes Ghana. And that's that's for clear reasons. And you know, the detribalization stuff is very representative of what happens in other African uh, post-colonies, I would imagine post-colonies elsewhere, because there's a huge practical need to have some kind of unification. That said, um, it's a huge force in sort of self-creation, which I don't just mean, you know, sort of, uh, I don't know, in, in, in some mushy proverbial sense, but actually getting customary laws documented um, because the dominant categories of thinking oneself are not at that point uh, racial or national, right? I mean, they're sort of sub-ethnic is the best word, um, I think, to describe them. So you are in the middle of raging Fanti Ashanti wars. Um, and, you know, the Dutch and the British are enlisted as help on both sides, but it's not seen there as primarily an inter-imperial conflict by a lot of people writing. It's seen as a a conflict between locals, right, who both think they have civilizational advantage over the other. Um, so what happens in the Fonti case is because they are for all sorts of reasons, which an 18th century and 17th century historian could speak to better than me, um, they are more open to sort of really being into Protestantism. Um, again, mostly Methodism, but not always. Um, the Basel 
uh, institution was non-denominational theoretically. Um, and that gives them kind of an in, you know, to sort of traveling back and forth a lot more often between London um, and the Gold Coast, schools go up. Um, and so their uniqueness, you know, kind of gets reinforced as far as they're concerned. Um, so then Casely Hayford takes it upon himself to explain why Fantis are actually um, most closely related to the ancient Greeks. Like, like that is their civilizational kin. Um, and certainly, you know, there's a kind of identification with the Yoruba at that point because we have this proto-national state uh, in Lagos rising. But it, it, it is just, I can't emphasize enough how grand the dimensions are that it takes on. Now, the other reason just briefly for where you might see an actual historical uniqueness, and again, I have to, I you know I have a complete PhD. I'm not an historian as such. I'm interested in the forms of expression. Um, but is that, you know, colonization isn't colonization isn't colonization, right? And Kwame Apia writes about this in, in my father's house. Uh, in his case, Ashanti's, but also Fanti's had actually extremely open relationships with colonial administrators. A, a lot of debate, um, a lot of argument. Um, you know, there's this, uh, this governor, um, Gordon Gugisberg, is actually Canadian, who ends up founding the Achimota School, which is where most Ghanaian presidents, you know, have gone to school. Um, and he writes what he thinks is a super progressive constitution and franchising the natives. And then he gets really crestfallen all in his letters because they're mad at him. <laughs> I mean, you know, there, there's this weird, they have salons and, and sort of, um, it's not the same situation as where I started off my career, you know, in Southern Africa with a settler colonial set of norms. Um, so I think there is some unique there actually for the rest of the continent. And then in terms of the institutions they successfully found, um, the Aborigines Rights Protection Society, um, and then the National Congress of British West Africa, those are absolutely historically unique. No one else does that at that point in time. And so it kind of is like, it's like a snowball, right? It, it builds on itself this mythology of being the bringers of ultimately Christ. And then just really quickly to your last point, I think where we lose track of this strain of, of thought which I'm really, in the book I'm working on now, um, like my next next book, I'm thinking of as what we gain by returning a tradition of moral thought to African studies, um, is that actually we see a lot of this stuff continue in the founding of uh, an indigenous Christian theological tradition um, all over Africa. And a lot of the top scholars on the continent end up being trained at seminaries through the 20th century, Kwame Vidyako, Kwesi Dixon, um, guys, guys like that, and that's where local language learning goes, right? So when we yeah. split off these scholarly traditions, you just really can't see um, all of the different things in which law, to go back to this conference topic, is imbricated Im intimately. I hope that answers some of your, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So we'll, um, we'll go to the, um, the queue now. Um, so we have a question from um, Sangeeta Ray. Um, um, it says, um, maybe Liz can think through as to how, when you have a field like post-colonial studies founded on a critique of liberalism, um, how that field can be so easily dismissed in a time of rising global fascism. Is one then not being revanchist? Um, and do we need stars like Fred Moten to indicate the strength of a field with many young scholars, including Palomi Saha, have used postcolonial theory brilliantly to do their work. I have a response essay coming out in MLQ called Postcolonially Speaking that is in itself a critique of the move to, to post critique and the obvious reasons why it has gained no traction in the field. Um, and finally, how does one collapse folks like Spivak, Baba, Assad, and Abbas in one breath? Um, dismissing the former two and authorizing the last two when no one would think that they are so different from one another. Thanks, San Sangeeta. We will obviously have to dialogue about this on other occasions. Um, but um, I mean, really quickly, um, I obviously can't answer all of those points, but um, I would want to say that um, one of the arguments um, I'm really invested in is that our definitions of fascism and power came of age in the 70s largely when theory was also being taken up in the Anglo-American Academy. Um, and I'm not sure fascism today looks the same as it did in 1970 during the Cold War and that our theories of how power shores itself up are operative still today. I mean, I think all we need to do is open the New York Times and we're given with examples of the ways, you know, 
power mobilizes paradox and contradiction and ambiguity precisely. It weaponizes those qualities. Um, I do actually think that there are profound similarities. I would want to hold Talal Assad off to the side, but between Baba and Spivak um, that perhaps have less to do with critique than with the fact that their thought is invested in a recurring set of moves and assumptions that we as theorists have not held up to scrutiny. Um, and so what I'm calling for is not doing away with critique, it's for a real rethinking of the tools we use to critique because, um, and we probably disagree here, I actually do think that those tools can be misguided and that they are becoming increasingly ill-equipped to either diagnose or intervene within our contemporary political context. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, you are correct in calling me out for perhaps being a little polemical in my characterization of post-colonial studies. Obviously, there's all sorts of amazing work being done within post-colonial theory today. We can just look at our computer screens and we will get it. Um, but um, um, I still would leave us with the question um, it's one thing to say doing away, do away with critique. I'm not saying that. Um, it's saying critique is too much of what we do and we need to supplement it with other kinds of intellectual activities. Um, and so I think that's what, what I'm trying to say that we need to create more space for um, both in our scholarship um, and in our pedagogy and, and all of the above. But thank you. Thank you. So, um, so unfortunately, our time is up. Um, this was this was another great panel. Thank you all so much, um, panelists and chair. This has been really exciting. Um, first two panels. Um, we're now going to take an hour break. If you're on the West Coast, that means um, we'll reconvene at 1:45. But we'll reconvene an hour from now. We have many exciting things to come. So, um, everyone, um, uh, take a minute and um, see you back here um, in one hour. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>